Hi everyone, I'm Adam Liao and welcome to Taste of Camden. A little bit different this year because of course we're going virtual. So not just welcome to Taste of Camden, but also welcome to family dinner in my kitchen. I'm gonna take you through a really simple three course. Well, it's not really three courses, it's kind of two courses, but three dishes. But we're gonna do it in half an hour. So it is super, super simple. First thing we're doing is a roast chicken. Slightly different roast chicken, I mean, these dishes are the ones that I do at my house all the time. So I can tell you that they are legitimately quite simple to do for a family of four or six or whatever you happen to be. Fish sauce roast chicken, one of my most popular recipes actually, it was in my second cookback, cookbook back a few years ago. And even to this day, I see people on Instagram tagging me almost every single day saying that the cooking business has become a family favorite of theirs. So I'll show you fish sauce roast chook, very, very simple there. Then we're gonna do a, a Thai style salad, a som tam, um, the classic green papaya salad, but we're not gonna use green papaya. Of course you can use green papaya, but a lot of people say, what can I use if I don't have green papaya? And carrot is a really good option. Cucumber too, as well, green mango, all of these kind of things. So we're gonna do a carrot som tam today, and then we're gonna finish with uh, almond tofu. It's not really tofu, it's kind of like an almond flavored panna cotta for dessert with a bit of a ginger and palm sugar syrup. All right, let's get started. Oh, I should mention, all of these recipes are on the council website. So if you want to cook along, or if you even want to read along, you know, you can go get the recipes now and read along as we're doing this. And I, I think this is in many ways nicer or better, or at least more useful than if we were able to do this live, because you can watch this back, you can cook along with me, you can pause it at the times you want. It's, you know, I encourage you to, rather than just watching, to go and make these recipes because they are delicious. My family will be having this food for dinner tonight. All right, let's start with our fish sauce roast chicken. Roast chicken, but I want to make kind of, um, it's not really a dressing, it's more of, it'll, it'll kind of turn into a glaze when we do this. And the base of it, obviously, as you can tell by the name, is fish sauce. So. About a tablespoon and a half of fish sauce in and some dark soy sauce. Dark soy sauce, whether I'm doing an Asian style roast chicken or not, is something that I always, always add to a roast chicken, even if I'm doing you know, paprika and garlic or whatever. Because the dark soy sauce adds, firstly, umami, uh, this kind of savory taste uh, to our chicken. But it also helps you colour the skin as well because sometimes um, it can be hard to get a really good colour on the skin. So the dark soy sauce, really good addition to any roast chicken. Some garlic, give that a squash. Roughly chop that. Garlic, roughly chopped, is generally fine. You know, I got asked the other day why I don't use a, a garlic press and the, the reason I don't use a garlic press, firstly, they're quite difficult to clean. <laughs> Even, well, they're not really, you can rinse them under some running water, but garlic, when you crush it too small, it can burn very easily. So when garlic burns, you get that bitter garlic taste rather than the garlicky garlic taste. So I tend to give it a bit of a crush, give it a bit of a chop, and then put it into whatever it is I happen to be using it for. And that will, I guess, preserve more of the garlic flavor. I've got some chili as well. I'm using green chili, you can easily use red chili. Take the seeds out. And I'm using a large green chili. <laughs> I have to admit, um, I used to eat a lot of chili, as in, as in hot, spicy chili. But as I've had kids and as time goes on, I time, try to eat kind of less spicy food. Um, Sometimes I really do like you know, something really hot, but generally, as, as, a, as a dad, it kind of makes my life a little bit more difficult with young children if I'm ha having something hot and then having to cook a separate dish for the kids. So I tend to make food that's more mild and then I'll add chili in later. So I do still like hot food, but I'll add bird's eye chili or something later to this to, to my portion rather than forcing the kids to try their hand at chili earlier. Coriander too. So very important thing with coriander. This is gonna, we're gonna use a whole coriander plant. So everything attached to one root. Now coriander has flavor all the way through the plant. You've got the leaves, you've got the stems and you've got the root as well. But 
very important but with coriander is the flavor is actually different. The leaves have a certain type or number of uh, flavor molecules, flavor chemicals in there. The stems and the roots are slightly different. So I'm not going to take you through the chemistry of it, but the thing that's important, the thing that you need to know about this is that the flavor of the leaves will be lost more quickly in cooking than the flavor of the stems and the roots. So when I'm cooking, when I'm applying heat to something, I'll tend to try and use the roots and the stems only and then add the leaves later. And that's exactly what we're gonna do in this recipe. So finally chopping the stems and the root. Uh, and you know, you can eat these raw too. Um, the root obviously is a little bit tougher, but absolutely I use this in dressings and so forth. Certainly don't throw the roots out. Whatever you do, don't do that because that is losing most of the flavour that you're trying to get to. And then some sugar. So I'm going to put in about probably a tablespoon of sugar into that. Mix this around. Have I forgotten anything? Yes, I have. I knew I was going to. Just testing you out. <laughs> if you're ready, this is a problem. You've got a recipe, I don't have a recipe. So if you guys are cooking along at home and you're looking and saying, why has he done that? Or maybe that's different to the recipe. I'm in trouble, but I mean, I do change recipes when I'm cooking them quite often, so don't, uh, don't hold me too much to it. Half a lemon in there. And just mix that to dissolve the sugar. So this is gonna go on top of this, our chicken. I'm gonna butterfly the chicken, or spatchcock it sometimes it's known as, and that process, whole chicken here, the reason I butterfly or spatchcock it is to remove uh, the backbone, or well, I mean, that's what we do. The reason we do it is to lay the skin all up one way. It gives you a much better skin on the chicken and actually cooks faster. And by cooking it faster, you also, I think, get a much more moist chicken as well. So there's a lot of reasons to do this and people shy away from it because I think it's really difficult. But as you can see, it's not overly difficult. You don't need poultry shears, you don't need a cleaver. This is just a regular pair of kitchen scissors that I'm using. And you just need to get the spot right, cut through the backbone down either side. This is my roasting pan. I'll either, you know, quite often when I'm roasting, I'll roast in a pan or even a frying pan. You know, something that's relatively snug to fit the chicken um, because by spatchcocking it, all the skin's up, so that's gonna, not gonna uh, be a problem, but by having the chicken kind of fit quite neatly into the pan means that it's not gonna dry out too much. You see what else I did there? Just cutting the bones up a little into a, what's called a trivet that will keep the, the flesh of the chicken off the base. Um, I'm gonna cut a touch of onion as well. I think that would be a good idea. into the bin. And this onion as well will just go on the base of the pan to hold the chicken off the pan a little bit, let the warm air circulate underneath it. So just roughly chopping that. And this will add a nice flavor to the chicken too. Essentially it just means by putting this trivet down that the chicken won't burn on the bottom of the pan and it also, the hot air circulating underneath it will allow it to cook a little bit faster as well. Okay. Chicken, obviously. Skin up into the pan. And then all of our dressing, our marinade, over the top of it. Now this is the kind of thing you can do the day before, the morning before, you go to work, you can do it when you come home, throw it straight in the oven now, totally, totally fine. I think giving it a bit of time to marinate does help. Um, but let me first wash my hands and I'll come and show you what this looks like. So 
Sorry for not being on the camera. I haven't gone too far. You can still hear my voice. But obviously after handling chicken, you do have to give your hands a wash. That's also why I cut it on this separate board here so I can move the board away. I'm actually gonna wash the handle of my knife as well just because I've been handling things. It's quite a luxury for me to be doing a cooking demonstration with running water and things. Usually I'm kind of stuck with what I've got on a stage, so this is good. All right, put this away. And this, wait there, this is what our chicken looks like. Hello. Um, it, it's, you can see that the, the dark soy sauce is starting to kind of color the skin of the chicken and that's exactly what we want. So as I said, you could leave this overnight. You could marinate it for longer or you could throw it into the oven straight away. Let me just put this aside because actually I've already got one in the oven. That will pull out when we're getting things done. I can smell it actually. It's looking pretty good. Mm, on to our salad. All right, I'll get a, a cloth just to wipe down the board a little. So our som tam salad. Carrots, these are the ingredients. So let me just lay them all out for you. Carrots, some chili, red chili I'm using this time. Some garlic, lemon, lime, sorry. I'm looking at another lemon at the same time. This is some palm sugar, and I've got some regular sugar as well. Some peanuts, some uh, cherry tomatoes, and I'll have one more ingredient actually. Hold there. It's around here somewhere. Yeah, these, I brought them from home. <laughs> you can use, uh, traditionally, for a somtam, you're using dried shrimp or dried, uh, dried prawns. I'm gonna use today some dried scallops. I think they give a slightly different flavor. Certainly, you could use dried prawns as well. And I think what's really important for Somtam is one of these, a mortar and pestle. If you see it made in Thailand or in Laos or something like that, they're made in these kind of giant earthenware mortar and pestles and all the ingredients go in there and get mashed together. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But first, let me take you through the shredding process. I'm not gonna peel these carrots. I think for a salad like this where we are going to tenderize it a little bit, the peel of the carrot actually has a lot of flavor. Um, some people don't like it because it's got maybe a slightly firmer texture, but I think in a salad like this, where it's gonna be bruised and, and softened by a dressing, it does work really, really well. I've got a shredding peeler here, which is a really useful thing to have if you're gonna be making uh, dishes like this. And this is basically what it does. You just run it through like a regular vegetable peeler and you get these lovely threads of your carrot or your green mango or your green papaya, whatever it happens to be, your cucumber that you could be using it for. And if you're making a salad like this, you can see, you know, great for Vietnamese food too, if you're making like do chua, the, the, the Vietnamese pickle, or even a banh mi, you can see uh, carrot shredded like this in a banh mi. So get your, get your hands on one of these if you can. They are a very useful thing to have. I just wanna peel a couple of, maybe, Let's do three carrots here. So this is a really interesting, I, I think conceptually, um, it can teach you a lot about how to make a salad, not just a salad like a, a, a somtam, but also other salads as well, because somtam I think the, the key to it is firstly seasoning, and we'll talk about that in a second too, but secondly also, a relationship, if you can call it that, between <clears throat> the ingredients that go into the salad and the dressing. And what's important with that is, that's kind of what a salad is. We often think that a salad is, you've got a bunch of ingredients and then you get a, the flavor is all in the dressing, you put that over the top. 
but a somtam is very different. And frankly, all salads are not really like that as well because what you should be doing with the salad is using the flavor of your ingredients, in this case, mainly um, some carrot, to inform your dressing. I'll explain what I mean in a second. Maybe one, one more, one more carrot in there. Just for some extra volume. Of course, if you have access to green papaya, please do use that. That's the classic. Um, and these here, the reason I'm not putting these in the bin is because I'm going to use these for stock later. I save lots of vegetable offcuts for stock, and, and certainly in these days where we're all trying to reduce waste, um, hopefully. I think that's a very good thing to do. So I put the carrot to one side, and I'll bring my mortar and pestle. Now, if I had one of the big Thai mortar and pestles here, I've got one. Uh, but I didn't want to use it today because I want to show you how to do it at home with probably one that you might have if you're not Thai yourself. We want to start building the dressing in this. So this is a kind of, the process happens this way. We start with the seasonings and things in the base of our mortar and pestle. We pound those and we, we balance our seasoning of essentially the dressing. And then we start to add the ingredients in and we bruise the ingredients in there. What that process does, it starts to release the juices of the tomatoes, the beans, etc., and then later the carrot, and those juices mix with our dressing to give us, you know, it, it's not just using a dressing to flavor the, the vegetables, the vegetables are flavoring the dressing too. Let's, uh, I'll show you what I mean. People struggle with salads like this sometimes because a lot of Vietnamese food or Thai food or Southeast Asian food generally, dressings like these will be balanced in three different ways, three different tastes, I guess. We've got sweetness. So I've got two sources of sweetness going in here, some regular sugar and some palm sugar. The reason I use that is because they're just different levels of sweetness. I don't want an overpowering palm sugar flavor. I could use just regular sugar if I wanted to. I could use just palm sugar, but then it would be a bit too strong, a bit too caramelly. And then we've got sour in the form of some lime here could use lemon as well if I was so inclined. So I'm squeezing the lime, and actually I might use some of that lemon. Um, to go into now, and then we've got our savory ingredient, which is going to be fish sauce. And that's going to pro provide umami, the, that sort of savory taste, but also saltiness as well. And people get confused because you're like, you're mixing together three different tastes. And so if it tastes too sweet, it's kind of like, what do you do? Do you, do you add more sourness or do you add more saltiness? How do you get that right balance that you're looking for? Chicken's looking great. That's been in for uh, about half an hour now. So I'll give it another sort of 10 minutes. That's another thing about butterflying a chicken. You know, it does allow you to uh, cook it a lot faster. You know, if you're roasting another ch a chicken, you might take an hour or so, but this is about sort of a 40-minute 40, 40 job for a chicken about the size that we've got, which is, I think it's a number 15 chicken, so 1.5 kilos. That's what the numbers mean. If I say it's a number 18 chicken, means 1.8 kilos. If it's a number 19 chicken, 1.9 kilos, 1.6, 1, it's number 16 chicken. You know, you, you get what I'm saying. Where's my pistol? Right next to me. So. How do you balance a dressing when you've got three competing tastes? So if it is too sweet, let, let's just taste this, you know. Um, let's taste this. And as suspected, it is too sweet because I haven't added enough sourness yet. So the, I'll put the sugar in and it doesn't really matter. You know, the, the recipe that you've got in front of you will have quantities, but it's not hugely important I guess what those quantities are, because even if I say add juice of one lemon, some lemons are sweeter and more sour than others, some have more juice than others. So this is kind of the important part. You want to be able to judge the taste of something yourself. 
Okay, so the extra lemon juice has gone in. That's tasting a lot better. So now I know that this is in balance. Taste it one more time just to be sure. That tastes good, and that's all you're looking for. You're looking for it to taste good. Because people's tastes are different too. If I like things that are a bit more sweet, then I might want to add more sugar to it. If I like things that are a bit more sour, more lemon juice. But what doesn't change is the fact that in building the dressing in here, we've got a balance of sweet and sour. We add our savoury, our third ingredient, our third taste. Well, salty and savoury, so it's kind of third and fourth taste. But this is not sweet or sour. So the sweet and sour is already in there, it's already in balance, and we don't have to worry about it anymore. That's the fabulous thing. So now I can add a drop of this, or I could add a cup of this. It's not going to change how sweet or sour this is. So what I would say is just keep adding this in until you get to a point where your dressing has gone from being sweet and sour, a bit like lemonade, to something that's tasting a bit more savoury. And so at this point, that's a savoury dressing. It tastes really, really nice. What I want to do is actually add in a touch more savouriness because it's going to change a touch as we add some of these other ingredients. So let's do that now. Snake beans. Probably should have explained these before. Um, snake beans are really popular in Southeast Asian cooking, um, particularly Thai cooking. And they just they substitute a regular long bean if you, if you want to, green beans, I'm sorry I should say. Um, but you can see why they're called snake beans fairly obviously. Cut these into some lengths, about you know, four or five centimetres long. And we'll throw these into the mortar and pestle. I forgot to add my chilli already, so probably should have done that before the beans, because I do want to break the chilli up a little bit and garlic. The reason I didn't add these first, like if I'm doing this without you guys, the reason I would actually add the chilli and the garlic first and pound those up before I started building the dressing in there. But I, I didn't want, I guess, the addition of chilli and garlic to change what the, the point I'm trying to get across, because the chilli and the garlic are not the seasonings. You know, they, you know, these are flavourings. Big difference in cooking between seasonings and flavourings. You know, to be honest, the things that are seasonings tend to have pretty low flavour, fish sauce being a bit of an exception, umami ingredients being a bit of an exception, but you know, we, we use vinegar and sugar and salt because they don't have a flavour. You know, very easy way to kind of differentiate is whether you can smell it or taste it. And um, again, that's kind of like, do you taste it with your mouth or do you taste it or smell it with your nose? Because they are different things. You know, you, can, you can't smell sugar, you can't smell salt. You can smell vinegar, but that's um, it's a slightly uh, different thing again. But the things that are important to your cooking is the things that you taste. That's what seasoning is. You know, if you want to talk about the difference between flavouring and seasoning, that's kind of what it is. So you taste it with your mouth, seasoning, or do you smell it with your nose, which is a flavouring. So I'm going to add the garlic and chilli in there and just give that a bit of a pound as well, just to break up the chilies a bit, get the garlic flavour, not taste, kind of infusing into the dressing. Let me illustrate, all right? If you have, if you're cooking along, grab some of your coriander, pinch your nose, put it in your mouth, Start chewing it. Doesn't really taste like anything. But then let go of your nose and all of a sudden you've got this really strong coriander flavor that you can sense. Do, the thing, do that with salt or sugar or a seasoning and you pinch your nose, you can taste salt, obviously. You taste sugar, you're not gonna smell it. So just, you need to understand the relationship that your ingredients have to each other. So tomato is kind of both. You've got a bit of sweetness in tomato, you've got a bit of sourness in tomato, you've got a bit of umami in tomatoes, um, and you've got tomato flavour as well. So our ingredients kind of do all of these things. You know, our seasonings kind of do one or the other, just saltiness, just sweetness, just sourness. Um, but understanding your ingredients is kind of a really important part of cooking. So I know that now that I'm mashing these 
tomatoes a bit in the mortar that they are going to be releasing some of their sweetness into. Lovely. It's really, really nice. Into the dressing. And so I guess you could say, you now the dressing's now taking on a bit of a tomato juice characteristic. But it's only light. And of course I had the, the dried scallops in here before, or dried shrimp if you're using those at home. Now, what we could do, it would just fit, I think, putting the carrot into this dressing. But what I will do actually instead is put the dressing into the carrot. And the reason I want to do that is just to give me more room and to illustrate to you that you don't really want to mix, uh, skip this step. And this step, the important part, is actually, I mean, you look, use gloves if you want, but I'm going to be eating this, you're not going to be, so I'm happy to use my hands. Start working the dressing and the carrot together. And this is actually softening the carrot and also encouraging the carrot to give up its juices to the dressing itself. So you can see that the dressing and the salad are not two separate things in a sometime. And they shouldn't be if you're making a French salad or whatever. You know, that they should be a marriage of the flavours of the different vegetables and the dressing seasonings. So a bit of uh, lettuce. I'll just take some nice leaves for our bowl, a bit of colour contrast. Obviously, if this is a green papaya salad instead of a carrot salad, it's going to be a very different colour indeed. So just some leaves there. I'll take some peanuts, just put those through. And move the, our salad ingredients into the bowl. This is it, you know, a really, really good side salad. You know, if you wanted to have a starch, I'll show you that close up a bit later on. Let me, let me wash my hands again. If you wanted to add a starch to this, absolutely, you could. Just some regular steamed rice is fine. If you want it to be more in the Thai style, some uh, sticky rice. Sticky rice is, is one of my favorite things, you know, from Laos and Thailand and that area of Southeast Asia, eaten with yeah, you know, like a roast chicken or a grilled chicken, absolutely fantastic. And the way to make it is very, very simple. You buy the glutinous rice, sometimes called sweet rice, um, soak it overnight, and then you can just put it into a bamboo steamer. So if you've got a bamboo steamer, put some uh, cloth in the bottom, just pour the soaked rice on top and then steam it for like 45 minutes. That's how long I steam it for. Um, and you've got lovely sticky rice to accompany anything. Like in, in Laos and Thailand, it's very common to have that as an accompaniment to, to grilled foods. So I actually do it for a barbecue a lot. You know, this is a great thing to do for a barbecue. You make a salad like this, you make um, some sticky rice and that can go with, you know, anything from your regular old barbecue sausage to a, you know, roast chicken. Let me show you a very quick dessert to finish off. It's an almond pudding or anindofu sometimes it's called. Really, really simple. Historically, this was actually made with apricot kernels. Um, apricot kernels, uh, there's two different varieties in Chinese cooking, north and south. One is more bitter than the other. If you want to try this out, you can get your apricot kernels, soak them in water and then blitz them up and squeeze it out to extract the apricot kernel milk. The taste is almost identical to almond milk. So you can use almond milk instead. You can actually make your own almond milk, you can buy almond milk, whatever you want. I'm doing kind of a slightly a japanese -ier version of this, which uses milk, just regular old cow's milk. But you could use, as I said, any of those other milks if you wanted to. The process of this, one litre of milk. This is essentially a panna cotta. It's a panna cotta version of the traditional Chinese dessert. 
I've got then, what am I doing? Okay, half a cup of sugar. So a liter of milk, half a cup of sugar. And I don't want to make this overly sweet because I'm going to make a syrup on top. The, de the dessert, I should have probably mentioned it for, to you earlier, is almond tofu with a ginger and palm sugar syrup. So the tofu, the panna cotta, is going to be lightly sweetened because there's a much sweeter syrup that goes on top. Um, and then 18 grams of powdered gelatin. I'm sure if uh, I was doing this in front of you as a live audience, you'd have your hand up now saying, what's the difference between powdered gelatin and leaf gelatin? Um, they're, the, they're kind of the same thing. The diff a lot of people, not so much in Australia, because we actually have a higher quality of powdered gelatin, I think, available in Australia, but in America, powdered gelatin can give you a less, it, it's kind of less pure, so it gives you a slightly cloudier gel. I think you can still make with powdered gelatin very, very clear gels, but the reason people often differentiate between the two is that your leaf gelatins will give you a very, very clear uh, liquid and your powdered gelatins might be slightly cloudy. Obviously, if you're uh, setting something that's opaque, it doesn't really matter. So for, for a, a milk-based panna cotta or whatever, powdered gelatin is much, much easier. So then I just put that on the stove. I won't do it for you because I actually did some before. They're already in the, in the, in the fridge. Whisk it on heat. Watch it very, very closely though, because you don't want the milk to boil over. Milk boils over very, very quickly, especially if there's um, uh, gelatin in it, because it just gives you more bubbles and more of that surface tension that's going to help it boil over. So watch it, stir it, keep whisking it um, to dissolve all of both the sugar and the gelatin. If you don't dissolve the gelatin, it's not going to set properly. So make sure you're dissolving both of those things. And then, uh, Take it out, take it off the heat. Very, very simple dessert. You know, we're not adding anything else to this. You could add some vanilla to it if you wanted to. Oh, we, we should have added one more thing to it, which <laughs> I forgot to tell you. Uh, almond essence. So because we're using regular milk, to make it almond tofu, we use almond essence. So a couple of teaspoons of almond essence in there. And you, you know, because this is a, a pretty simple Dessert, you could use other essences as well, you know, you could coconut or um, uh, hazelnut, that kind of thing. So if you want to make different flavoured panna cottas, you can use those natural flavours to do that. Let's make our syrup to go on top of it too. Cup of water. This is a simple syrup, so it's equal parts. Uh, no, it's not actually. It's, it's, I'm going to make it slightly different. So a cup of water... Um, to a little bit more uh, sugar than half, but not quite equal parts. So let's say three quarters of a cup of combined sugars, so palm sugar and um, regular white sugar, to come to about three quarters of a cup, and then some nice thick slices of ginger. So we're going to infuse the ginger into this syrup, just give them a bit of a bruise and drop it in. And then this again can go on the stove. To boil. I'll get one out of the fridge that I've done already. So I've got a couple of things to show you now. This is just barely set. You know, th these have only been in the fridge for about two hours now. They could do with another hour or so to set completely. But this is kind of what it looks like. It's a nice, pure kind of white jelly. I don't want to tip it too much because I think it's going to come out because it's just barely, barely there. And then our syrup. Let me get a spoon to show you that one. Oh. Our syrup here, once you refrigerate it, it becomes like a, a nice, thick syrup with a really, really nice ginger 
and palm sugar flavor. So, let me put this to one side just for the time being. So the, the, the liter of milk there will go to about, I've, I've made six of these uh, little tofu, almond tofu, almond jelly, almond pudding, uh, almond panna cotta, whatever you want to call it really. Oh, we've left the fridge door open, that's what that beeping is, if you can hear beeping. Now let me pull out our chicken. Now don't worry if it looks a bit darker than you're used to for a roast chook. I think it looks absolutely amazing. The reason it might look a little bit darker than you're used to is two things. Firstly, we have the um, uh, dark soy sauce on there, but also the sugar. Now, the sugar will caramelize onto onto the skin and make it a little bit darker. Just, just in, just in on the a half hour. This is looking great, it really is. Oh, almost lost it though. So let's take our chicken out here. Now, just want to make sure, hopefully, try and get it so that, because we've taken the, the backbone out, a lot of the structure of the chicken's actually gone, so it's easy to break apart which is great if you're serving it. You can just pull a leg off and, and eat that, but it does make it a little hard to transfer it to the, to the plate, particularly when it's very hot. There we go. Let me move this to the side. Um, I'll grab some lime actually. Lime would be nice. A couple of wedges of lime off to the side, and of course, can't forget about the coriander we reserved, so. Sort of roughly chop that and sprinkle that over. And this is, you know, you can see how easy it is. Start to finish in half an hour. Oh, well, I'll give you one of these too. Yeah, this one's quite set with a bit of our syrup just drizzled very lightly on top to complete. This is kind of like, I don't know, in some ways a upside down creme caramel with a few Asian flavors. So not really like that at all, but you get where I'm going with it. So three dishes, half an hour, a really, really good family dinner. Our fish sauce roast chicken, carrot somtum, and this is our almond tofu with palm sugar and ginger syrup. I really do hope you give these a go. They're, they're, they're super, super easy. And they're really, really delicious too. We're going to have this for dinner at home tonight. Thanks very much, everyone.